Hey, guess who's back with a brand new book to read? It is I, Madam Whippass. There'll Never Be a Story of Forgiveness by Thomas DeBarge. He has dedicated this book to his children and, gan- and grandchildren. He says, my mistakes are for you to learn from not an excuse for you not to succeed. Your race is designed especially for you to win, so go ahead and run. Remember to love and forgive. Never stop learning and growing as you're learning and growing. I love you. Chapter one is Roots. Of bitterness. Things couldn't have been good for daddy and mama during the 50s. That was a period of time in America when race issues were intense. Hate crimes were targeted by whites against blacks. The Ku Klux Klan strongly vowed to protect their interests by terrorist acts such as burning crosses, lynching, and murder and Rosa Parks refused to take a back seat on the bus. Interracial relationships were labeled as taboo, yet my father, Robert Louis DeBarge, a white man born in 1932, and my mother, Ederlene Abney, a black woman born in 1934, met in Detroit, Michigan, and fell in love. Despite the racist attitudes around them, they looked at each other and saw something deeper than skin. I'm grateful daddy and mama didn't let color influence their decisions. Had they shied away from each other because of other people's opinions, my brothers and sisters and I wouldn't have existed in our unique in our uniqueness. They gave birth to 10 DeBarge children together. Ederline Bunny, Robert Lewis Jr. Bobby, Thomas Keith Tommy, William Randolph Randy, Mark Dwayne Marty, Eldra Patrick L, James Curtis, Jonathan Arthur Chico, Carol Francis, Peaches, and Darrell. Docky. This is my family, my heritage, and my story as one of the siblings of the DeBarge family. <clears throat> Hello, everyone in chat. Mama's grandparents experienced the brutal reality of slavery in South Carolina. The fear, anger, depression, bitterness, regrets, and sorrow. These were things I believe to have been deliberately and systematically forced into the lives of black people. My family to make it more personal, not by slave masters, but by an evil spiritual force with the goal of exterminating a special God-given purpose. It was a setup to show God's power if one could hold true to his or her part of the agreement, which was to love, forgive, obey, and so on. If one had weak faith, though, it was a sentence of doom. It had been several generations since slavery ended, but Satan's initial plan of destruction was at work full force in my mind. Evil churned steadily, making me a servant to a different type of taskmaster, one that couldn't be seen or heard with physical senses. Error reigned in my home and eventually in my heart, even if I was unwilling to acknowledge it. I may have been born physically free, but my thoughts, which are spiritual in nature, were stained with the fears of my ancestors, I'm sorry. 
Um, I may have been born physically free, but my thoughts, which are spiritual in nature, were stained with the fears my ancestors sub succumbed to. Insecurities were passed on to me either unchecked or concealed by religion. I lacked value as a human being, which broke me down to accept the abuse I suffered as just being part of life. Mama's parents were William Preston Abney and Bessie Waters. They gave birth to William Jr., Uncle Bill, Claire, Mamie, Norman, Marjorie, Phoebe, Johnny, Ernestine, Etterling, Bobby, James, and David. There were 12 siblings total. Johnny passed away at the age of 14. He was said to have had brain damage and been retarded as a result of being dropped at birth. Phoebe died of cancer when she was 56 years old. Claire died at the age of 78 as a result of complications associated with diabetes. And Uncle Bill of the same age at 88. Ernestine, my mother's twin, died at age 70 of a sudden massive heart attack a short time after having had brain surgery. Uncle Bobby died from emphysema at age 73. Mama's father, Grandfather William, was a religious man. He believed in keeping his children active in the faith, so church attendance had been regular and mandatory during Mama's youth. Mama and her siblings were part of the choir he directed. They traveled as a singing group around their hometown, performing at churches and the local radio stations for the white folks, as they called them. It was tough at the radio stations because hosts and station managers weren't always kind or willing to let Negroes sing in to their white audiences. Mama, along with her family, held tightly to a godly hope that someday things would be better. Mama recalls her father riding a rickety motorbike about five miles to the factory where he worked to support his family. She remembered vividly the poverty of her youth. I wondered what this attitude had been like in such a struggle. If he was moody and and approached the daily routine as drudgery like daddy or if he had a good attitude when it came to taking care of his large family. She shared that her father made sure they didn't go hungry or suffer the need of the essential things in life. He had clever ideas that he put to use each day to meet their needs. She remembered him being resourceful and using his intelligence to come up with something out of nothing. Grandfather William's real joy was cooking. Mama smiled when she talked about a delicious steak sandwich he used to make. She said it was one of her favorites. She also reminisced about his special sauce for various meats being tasty. He prepared food and sold it for extra money. Perhaps he had daydreamed of one day opening his own restaurant or selling a cookbook that contained his personal favorites. Or maybe it just pleased him that his children enjoyed a good meal made by his hands. Grandfather William passed away a few years prior to Mama meeting Daddy. Mama experienced normal grief when her father passed away. Like any other youth, however, she took advantage of his absence. Grandfather William was a strict man who allowed no dating. He wasn't around so Mama dated. She was confident the relationship between her and Daddy would never have taken place had her father been around. A father's active role in the life of his daughter maintains a necessary level of respect when a young lady starts seeing a young man. Mama didn't honor her father's instructions along the lines of relationships, which prompted young men. Daddy specifically to treat her differently than had her father been on the scene. Mama's mother, Grandma Bessie, was a housewife who was loyal to God and to her husband. She had been raised by an aunt because her mother died at a young age, possibly during childbirth. 
I was five when Grandma Bessie passed away of a heart attack associated with diabetes. My memories of her didn't fade away. She was affectionate towards me and protective when Daddy tried to dole out the discipline around her. I missed seeing her after she died, and I longed for her protection when chastisement would come. She had good family values and showed her grandchildren much love. Mama's family lived in a newly built project-style home in Detroit. They were allowed to live in two units because of the large size of the family. One toy was often shared between all of her brothers and sisters. Clothing was never the latest fashion, but items were handed down until they had no more ability to withstand wear. Claire learned to sew and use her skill to make clothes for her brothers and sisters when she could get material. There were there was a local charity called Goodfellows that assisted the family by donating items upon availability. Through the suffering of never seeming to have enough, Mama learned to appreciate what she had. My father was born to John Arthur DeBarge and Francis Jane Walters. I never got to meet Daddy's parents. Both of them passed away when I was very young. Grandfather John was born in a French settlement in southern Indiana, and Grandma Frances was from Illinois and a member of the Morning Star Lodge Masons. Daddy shared with me that Grandma Frances was blessed to bear eight children amidst a few miscarriages. Daddy was the sixth child born. His brothers and sisters were Anna Mary, John, Francis Jane, Ronald Milton, George Raymond, Carol Yvonne, and William Earl. I wasn't able to obtain much more than hearsay from Daddy about his parents. Daddy didn't talk much about them or his past at all except in sharing amazing fables. It wasn't clear if his stories were fact or fiction. He said they were bigots and supposedly that was the root of their distant relationship. Growing up, it was like no other debarges existed in the world except me and my brothers and sisters. I didn't develop a rapport with much of Daddy's family at all. He kept us away from them, or they purposely stayed away from us. I reasoned why a relationship never took place with Daddy's family, coming to the conclusion that I was just an unlikable person. Dwelling on why his parents and siblings didn't love me and never even wanted to meet me was a preoccupation that made me feel anxious, like I wanted to become someone else who they would like. None of it mattered after a while because there was so much other chaos in my life. Daddy displayed character flaws that revealed evidence of a troubled childhood. If the rest of his family was anything like him, I was glad to have been kept at a distance. I had to accept his heritage as a part of me left blank in my memory. Uncle George, Daddy's older brother, died of cancer around 1995. Daddy grieved heavily over the loss. It was with great honor that I did meet Uncle George prior to his death. I also had an opportunity to meet and spend time with a second cousin bearing my name, Tom. They were parts of my daddy, which made talking with them unique experiences I cherished. They looked like him and had mannerisms like his. Detroit, Michigan was where it all began with daddy and mama. Daddy was stationed there in the army at the age of 21 when they coincidentally, when they coincidentally met. Mama had an interest in a young man named Robert Barnes, who was part of the same military unit as Daddy. She telephoned to speak with him. The person relaying the call was mistaken to have said Robert DeBarge. Both names sounded similar, so Daddy took the phone call. When they spoke, an inner connection was made. Daddy explained to Mama on that very first phone conversation that she was going to be his wife. Mama thought he was a crazy man and laughed at his absurd comments. 
They didn't even know each other and had never spoken prior to that moment. So the mention of marriage was ridiculous to her. Daddy was persistent in his declaration. In his mind, they had already met, dated, and fell in love. He was aggressive, intending to back up every word he spoke. They made plans that day on the phone to meet later in the week at the skating rink. They exchanged details about themselves so as to be identified by one another. Daddy would be wearing his uniform and Mama's attire would be a red dress veiled with a particular coat. Both anticipated putting faces with the voices they had enjoyed over the phone. Upon meeting, Daddy was impressed with Mama's outer beauty. She had dark, even-toned skin and was shapely. He perceived her to be a beautiful black woman without a flaw. Mama found Daddy was a handsome man. He was slim, not too tall, and had stark blue eyes. As the evening went on, Daddy found that Mama's loving spirit completed the package. They held interesting conversation, which passed the time quickly. The joyful evening of holding hands, laughing, and skating compelled them to continue seeing each other. Mama was a church girl who was supposed to be living by strict religious laws. Being at the skating rink was a sin. By overstepping the set guidelines pertaining to the skating rink, Mama was a backslider in the church's eyes. Hooking up with Daddy was icing on a hell-bound cake. He wasn't a Christian. All church girls knew not to associate with unsaved men. Though Mama professed love for God, she found that the church's rules were only flesh deep when it came to her feelings. What the preacher said didn't penetrate deep enough into her heart to keep her from the skating rink or from wanting to be with Daddy. Getting involved with a man of opposite background and ethnic origin didn't settle well in Mama's surroundings. Grandma Bessie was initially uncomfortable with her daughter's brow-raising relationship with a white man. She asked Mama what peace she thought she was going to have with the whole world against such a union. Mama's brothers and sisters questioned her rationale as well. All Mama knew was that she wanted to be with him. Daddy was a charmer. He quickly won the favor of Grandma Bessie with his generally pleasant personality. Mama's decision was eventually accepted by her siblings, though home wasn't the only territory where she had to contend for her preference. Mama was still a student when she paired up with Daddy. Classmates at her segregated high school couldn't understand her decision to be with someone not of the black race. Some condemned her while others shook their heads with compassion for her, perceiving her to be setting herself up for causeless difficulties. Friends attempted to reason with her by suggesting to her young black men who were fellow classmates. Mama was steadfast in her choice. I admired her courage in walking in what she believed, whether right or wrong. When she knew what she wanted, she proceeded with a quality of mind and spirit that was confident in the face of opposition. She continued to date Daddy at the cost of losing friendships. Daddy may not have been under religious restraints when it came to seeing Mama, but he was certainly breaking his family values values of racism. He was no longer in his parents' home, so he was free to be with any woman he pleased as long as she wasn't black. Mama told me daddy's mother went to extreme measures to keep the two of them from being together. She said Grandma Frances had offered her money to leave daddy alone. And when mama refused, she influenced the decision for him to be sent away on military duty, hoping to destroy their bond. That didn't work either. Daddy was scheduled for departure from Detroit by the army. He purposely missed his train so he could elope with Mama. He took her to the Hall of Justice where they officially became Mr. and Mrs. DeBarge. He then reported to his destination.
before in serious enough trouble to be reprimanded for violation of duty. Daddy made it a point to exclude any other choice of a mate besides himself or mama's life. He boldly told her she wasn't to have any other males in the picture. She wasn't allowed to talk to other young men, not even as friends. He made it clear that her life was to revolve solely around him. Mama may have taken a bit of pride in being a prized possession at the beginning. This being her first love relationship, she closed her eyes to, to the initial signs of daddy's dominating character. She was young and too naive at the time to realize the depth of pain that laid her back of possessiveness that made her feel special. She would later discover that daddy's syrupy words were poisonous fangs he would use to bite into the veins of those whom he said he loved. Whoa. Well, that was chapter one. And I think that's a great cliffhanger because I don't really have much time to read. And that was only eight pages. Well, you know what? Let me see. It's 105. Da, 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 da. No, no, no. I'm going to go ahead and read chapter two because that's only a few, about three or four pages. Chapter two, Daddy's or Mama's Fault. Early on in his marriage, Daddy trudged through each day under a great deal of stress. Him and Mama trying to fit in as a couple, the two of them trying to blend in, the rejection from his parents, the hard financial times, it all weighed heavily on him. Talking with him for the writing of this book, he commented that Mama was aggressive trying to establish her position within his family. She didn't get anywhere with that, he assured me. He felt that perhaps his family may have softened to accept his marriage had patience been applied, whatever that meant. He didn't go into details about particular situations. Reminiscing made him uncomfortable and angry. I felt like a stranger to him, like a passerby on the street who didn't even know his name. He was fired from jobs because of his black wife. He had certain privileges revoked once superiors found out about his interracial marriage. When children began entering the picture, Things were even more difficult. Daddy had a lot of mouths to feed on a small salary that seemed to be getting smaller. Wow. Since he wasn't a verbally expressive man, his inward frustration poured out in a negative, hostile manner. He was physically abusive to, towards me and several of my siblings. He seemed to take his anger out on me the moment I came forth from the womb. I saw him fight mama often. I grew up in a brutal atmosphere where a man overpowered a woman regularly. I didn't know what brought about arguments between them or if daddy was seeking to obtain his manhood or defend it. I only knew I feared him every moment of my young life. Daddy wasn't a fair man. He gave no advance warning of an altercation. And he didn't care that he was bigger and stronger. He just hit and yelled and hit. I hardly ever saw the violence coming. It was sudden, like a mighty gust of wind. I recalled one particular fight that I observed from the dining room with my older brother and sister. Daddy and Mama had been arguing. Suddenly, she landed on the kitchen floor with a loud thud unconscious as a result of one of daddy's blows. She lay there for a few moments as if she were dead. I stood still frozen in that moment, waiting for a small piece of evidence indicating she was still alive. She roused as daddy bent down to help her up. He assisted her to the bedroom and made us kids go upstairs to bed. His loud one-sided conversation with her could be heard throughout the house all night long, I listened for her voice. I only heard his. 
The next morning, Mama got us kids up, fed us breakfast, and sent us off to school. I watched her, wondering if she was really okay. Her face was bruised. She was quiet, and she didn't make eye contact. I thought about that incident throughout the day. I couldn't get the image of Mama lying lifeless on the floor out of my head. And when the last bell rang, I was afraid to go home. I didn't tell anyone about the abuse that went on. None of us kids ever told anything. We were too afraid. Daddy was an extremely angry man with the little self-control. And when upset, he let his emotions loose taking out his rage on those who couldn't fight back. Mama was the underdog, the victim that was going to lose every time. He appeared to be an insensitive husband while saying, I love you. He fussed at her all the time. What kind of man gets married to beat a wife? Did he just fight her like that for no reason? I began to wonder what Mama did that made him constantly angry with her. Daddy's wrongs were evident. I was quick to blame him for things, but what about her? I was on the outside looking in, questioning in my heart why two people who seemed dissatisfied with each other stayed together as long as they did. I didn't know where to begin trying to understand Daddy, so I just let my sympathy encompass Mama. I was too concerned for her safety to find compassion for him. I held on to a hope that he did have some love in his heart for someone. God created everyone with love. I waited for it to kick in someday. Daddy would fake niceness in the public eye. When he was with us out somewhere around other people, he would speak kindly to me. I loved that. He would call me son. Talk to me about different products on the shelves at the grocery store and make me laugh. I never got that type of favorable attention from him, so I gobbled it up like a hungry dog. And before I learned, it was a front only for outsiders. I had attempted to carry on our friendly demeanor at home. It was business as usual with him yelling and pushing me around when people weren't looking. I remembered another instance when Daddy took me for a ride, just him and I. Initially, I was excited just to be going somewhere with my Daddy since I never got that father-son time with him. He drove me to an old, shabby, abandoned house and told me to get out of the car. I suddenly feared him hurting me without anyone knowing. He had me follow him inside where he began explaining to me that I wasn't his son. He told me that we were standing in the house where Mama often met her lover. This other man, he said convincingly, was really my father. He even went as far as showing me a man's name etched in the wall in what he insisted was Mama's handwriting. I wasn't aware of Mama cheating on Daddy. She was always either home or at church. So I wasn't sure when she would have made that time. I knew daddy wasn't faithful in the marriage, though. Everyone knew that. His actions stood out like snow in the summertime because he was always the white man in a hood full of blacks. He had two kids that we knew of outside of his marriage to mama. Deathra and Alice with a neighbor lady in Detroit. When Mama found out, she accepted the girls. We'd play together and Mama would look out for them with clothes from garage sales. She she reasoned it wasn't the kid's fault what had happened. And when Daddy became a truck driver, he'd be away from home for long periods of time. That was when numerous adulterous affairs came to light, all with black women. Mama just seemed too motherly to me to be a cheater. Still, I believed Daddy when he told me I wasn't his son. If he wasn't my father, that would explain his meanness towards me. If he was lying, I took it to be the way he really felt about me, that in his heart, he really didn't perceive me as his child. It troubled me to know that the family I cherished really wasn't mine. 
Neither daddy or mama appeared to be happy. Mama relied heavily on church as her bandage. She grinned and bore a lot. Church, as I recall, didn't keep me from getting hurt or her either. Still, she was always there trying to ease her pain and find hope. Daddy balled up his fist to beat the hope out of her. I had heard the preacher say that love was kind and that it never failed. I was confused. That couldn't have been the same love that held my parents together. It would seem that Daddy and Mama shared a physical bond that fell short of the complete system of love that was set up to protect all involved. Their initial physical attachment seemed to remain on the physical plane, as evidenced by the discord in our home. They never got to the root of their dysfunction, and so we all lost out. Mama stayed with Daddy despite things that would have made any other woman walk away. He was always hitting her and cheating on her. Still, she remained his wife for many years, whether it was the financial security for her and us kids, her dedication to church rules that said no divorce, or if it was simply because she loved him. She put up with daddy's issues. She admitted once she saw the messy adult lives her children had attained that perhaps she stayed with him too long. I wondered what things would have been like had she obeyed her father and the church and not been so quick to date or even venture off to the skating rink. Daddy wasn't a man of conviction, so his actions were to be expected of an unsaved man. Mama was the one with the covenant agreement, agreement with God himself and had reneged professing faith with her her mouth, but standing condemned when it came to submission. The rebellion in both of their hearts settled in as my way of thinking. As I got older, Mama would tell me I was just like Bob, that being the short name she called my daddy. Well, I was just like her too. Daddy's anger, fear, and insecurity would come to control my interactions with others. I would later develop his reasoning when it came to looking for a pretty woman that may not have been good for me. I would also find myself running into mama's roadblock when it came to relying on religion without a serious commitment to obedience. Like her, I didn't want to stay within God's guidelines, and I would pay sin's high price just like she did. Divorce was a formal statement indicating things weren't right between my parents. I was 15 when they finally split up for good after a couple of separations. I had mixed feelings about it. I was old enough to understand. Still, it hurt me to see them dissolve their commitment to each other. I felt the worst was over and daddy didn't really have to leave. He hadn't taught me much along the lines of survival, and he certainly hadn't allowed me an opportunity to know him. I was brokenhearted. When he left, it seemed he took a part of me that could be whole and left me only with the portion that would never amount to anything. I was a very angry young man. My mind reasoned that Daddy and Mama hadn't earned my respect, so I wouldn't give them any. I spoke a lot of bad things about each of them, I had to admit. I was totally guilty, dishonoring my parents because I didn't believe either of them had ever loved me. I owed my parents honor no matter what went down in the past, but I felt I had a right to despise them. For a long time, I refused to forgive. The days of condemnation towards them did come to an end late in adulthood, but only after a great deal of suffering. God allowed my lot in life for a reason only he knew. I had to learn and grow to trust him to heal me of it all. Fear, the fiercest enemy of my soul, nearly consumed me in the process of growing up. 
My foundation of truth, love, and honesty was hit with such harsh blows that proper thinking was forced out of balance. My parents were supposed to guide me and nurture my talents. They were supposed to speak life into me. I didn't know then that I was born to complete a spiritual assignment in this physical world. I was commissioned to do something special through music and my testimony. It was a mission the enemy would try to destroy through my relationship with my parents. Because of an unstable foundation of faith and a chaotic home front, the musical talent I would develop would go astray. When that went left, my mind, body, and soul followed. It was Satan's intent to keep me from telling the world about true love by simply influencing me to sing a, per a perverse song. When I find myself thinking about da Daddy and Mama now, I pray and give thanks for them. I can confidently say today that I have forgiven them. It was such a blessing for me to survive a physical war that was actually spiritual in nature. The pages following are a summary of my life as I grew up in the DeBarge family and my life thereafter. I'm hopeful that my story of faith and forgiveness will help you. All right, so that concludes the reading of There Will Never Be, A Story of Forgiveness by Thomas DeBarge. So far, so good. It's very compelling, if you ask me. Um, so that was the first two chapters. I must go now, but I will be back soon with a follow-up with uh, some more chapters, and hopefully I can read a little bit more at that time. So thank you all for tuning in, but I must go now. Peace.